Greetings. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm excited to be here. It's such an honor to be, uh, be able to recognize, to represent the late, great Reginald Lewis uh, and talking about our entrepreneurial journey. I want to share that my entrepreneurial journey started really early in life under the steps in high school where I used to write notes for my classmates that hooked school the day before. <laughs> See, they needed an adult speak with a smart penmanship, right? My father would say to my brothers and I that you don't need for someone to give you a job. What you need to do is figure out what folks need, what service they need, and provide that. Well, I didn't necessarily get caught for my entrepreneurial antics, but I remember being busted by my girlfriend's mother when she found out I was changing her grades from E's to B's and from D's to C's. Because <laughs> my mother told me that if I took typing, that I would always be able to get a job. Mm -hmm. So I spent most of my career as a management consultant in nonprofit management. And so I was very familiar with providing strategic planning and organizational development and business planning. But my business actually grew out of sitting in a boring ass meeting. <laughs> it was a response to the sideways shade that my friendly colleagues would give to black led organizations. It was the fuck you to the retired in place HR director at the major university where I worked for 14 years as the director of staffing and staff training. See, I went to him when I observed that blue collar workers, those facility workers that had been on those jobs for years and years and years, didn't have access to training and professional development. The only way they really went to training was as a result of a disciplinary action because they didn't meet PRD. So when I came to him and I said, you know, what about training for those facility workers? And his retort to me was, well, if someone was cutting grass, why would I need to provide them with training? So I looked at him and I paused because I was waiting for him to laugh, right? He was going to laugh. <laughs> and he did. So I was thinking to myself, bitch, really? <laughs> How did you get your pay stuff? Because it damn sure wasn't mailed to you because you have to be able to log in on the state system to be able to figure out if the actual hours that you work, you were getting compensated for. So what I was experiencing and what I was seeing was a form of apartheid that was flagrant yet subtle. It was an example how the nonprofit industrial complex uses its systems to oppress people. My mother and father were born black here in Baltimore City at the time of the end of the Great Depression, where racial redlining, segregation, housing policies are still in the books today, coupled with desegregation that unravel the fabric of our community, both the social fabric and the social capital of our community. Because back in the day when Mr. Jones lost his job, he could reach out to Mr. Williams and say, can you put a good word in for me mm. at the plant? Right? Well, Baltimore isn't unique in how it leverages discrimination to define the lifespan of black people. There are not many places where you can even go in this world, in this country, where black people are not impacted by identity politics. Those same identity politics that shrunk my mother, dark skin, ability to have access to social and economic and educational opportunities. You see, oppression is the underbelly of our society. It is the linchpin that makes it so that people like myself that are dreaming of providing a business and a service and a product, we understand that space is important to make that happen. 
So, I was very excited when I decided to do what Susie Orman said not to do. <laughs> and that was to liquid my 401k to build out a space called the Living Wealth Center for Social and Economic Vibrancy, where we are celebrating 10 years. It was the best feeling. I was elated that I had a vision and a dream that was coming to fruition until I received my first bg &E bill. Mm. <laughs> which was $4,000 because the contractor that was hired by the landlord didn't hook the HVAC system up properly. And let me tell you something, BG and E don't give a hot damn about your issues with your landlord. So I know many of you are sitting here thinking, what did you do? Well, let me just say that I am not my credit score. <laughs> so we spent six years at 2443 North Charles Street where like-minded people got together and we created solutions for problems by us for us. We celebrated milestone anniversaries. We celebrated our cultural tra traditions, and we got together, and we built businesses and brands. And so throughout the rainstorms that rained inside the building and the 35 documented 311 calls because the landlords would not come and pick up the trash out back, all right now, yep. we received an eviction notice for an unpaid CAM bill. Now, many of you are asking yourselves, what's CAM? Well, CAM is a fee that you pay as a retail tenant. It's called a cleaning and maintenance fee, which was funny for us because we ain't never seen nobody come by and clean up that spot. <laughs> we experience our roof leaking water, which required us to change the floors at the tune of $20,000. Still no phone calls back. No phone calls back. And so I thought to myself, this is the same oppression yep. that keeps undermining our ability to move forward. Because we created this space. We created this movement so that we could not be in power, but seize power. So, local organizations reached out to me and said, you know, Marissa, we want to help you and we're going to send you some attorneys. So I said, that is great. So each attorney would call and the first question they would ask me is, what's a CAM fee? You are not my guy. <laughs> In order for me to meet these landlords, or I should say slumlords in court, I needed to be prepared. I needed to make sure that we were prepared with a commercial real estate attorney that understood what a CAM fee was. And so we put up a crowdfunding, a GoFundMe, to raise the money to cover the attorney, and with a day and a half, not even a day and a half, we were able to raise $4,000. It spoke volumes. So we got to court. And the judge said, where did y'all get these numbers from? So I'm looking at the people from across the aisle like, yeah, where did y'all get these numbers from? <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't want to return my call earlier about these numbers. Right, he also said that it's illegal to evict someone for a camp fee. <laughs> So what I recognized that after we helped to activate a community, they wanted their real estate back. So we did go to court. And after all of that, the judge decided, even though they were dead wrong, they said, you guys work it out. You work it out. And so we must realize that as Reginald Lewis says, 
The dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately. <laughs> and as a business owner, you not only need to have a plan B, C, D, E, F, and G, you must have a relationship with your higher power yes, and perseverance. So I want to say to you today, when we are 10 years standing strong, we have been healing the soul of the city, and I would leave you with, why should white guys have all the fun? Because we are empowered to make our own revolution. Because it will not be.